Welcome back. All right, let's dig deeper into Premier Lee's government work report delivered to the National People's Congress. David Fry, a partner in the market strategy practice at KPMG, and Professor Zhu Ning from Shanghai Jiaotong University are here to discuss just that. Of course, we also have the lovely Lily here to share her Great insights to join the party. as well. So, gentlemen, welcome to the program. Professor Zhu, I'm going to uh, start with you first because that headline figure that we were all looking for, right, the GDP growth target for this year, around approximately 7%, right? Medium to high level of growth still achievable, according to Premier Lee. How hard do you think that is in this kind of global environment where we had 22 central banks easing already since January? I think even with the slowdown pace of Chinese economy projection, it is still quite high by international standards. So mm. I definitely do not think that it will be a walk in the park. That being said, I think if we look at a around the globe. I think the U.S. economy is still showing a lot of potential. The question is how much of the repatriation of manufacturing back to the U.S. will reduce its demand for foreign imports. Mm. And if you look at the rest of the world, Europe and Japan are probably not that promising. I think the biggest question, though, is still the emerging economy. Whether the tapering off of the, the quantitative easing by the U.S. Federal Reserve, how much of the weakening impact that's going to have on the global economy. So I think it's going to slow down. The question is how much of the international integration of the co economy and the financial system is going to bring down Chinese economic growth. Mm. With some stability, I think, in the domestic consumption and with the further reform, I think I'm still sort of confident with the, the government's ability in achieving its goal. We got two engines, right? Yeah, two yeah. new engines for yeah, growth. Yeah, let's talk about that. One of the engines involves mass innovation, and the other one involves investment in the public services sector and the financial reform. David, tell us what does this mean for foreign investors in China? Well, I think it's very important for foreign investors, and what we're seeing in, in China is to create the mass innovation is first a need to really align market incentives. Uh, create the opportunities for efficient capital allocation, make sure that when investments are made that there's opportunity to gain the return from the investment that is protected by intellectual property protections that are enforceable. Um, secondly, we'd really look for you know, environments of open source collaboration to facilitate that exchange of ideas between principally entrepreneurs and also we don't, especially in China, want to forget about the students. It's a critical employment-based target for the government and also a great source of innovation. And related to that, of course, the third element would be uh, effective talent management to drive that mass innovation. For the two engines, the twin engines in China, we have an opportunity or a need really to make sure that mass innovation is connected to the public sector reforms and the financial reform. Mm -hmm. And we, we see great opportunities and need in a couple of public sector example uh, areas, one being education, one being healthcare. Uh, great opportunity for innovation to contribute to growth in both of these areas and, and certainly an opportunity for foreign companies with advanced technologies, advanced uh, hospital management capabilities, hospital administration capabilities, large areas of demand and opportunity for foreign investors. Mm. And right. Professor Zhu, this is not just regular innovation because the Premier is calling for mass innovation, right? And you're in the finance industry, so how do you think finance can better help the real economy where we can get more of an entrepreneurial spirit here, more startups, more businesses? Because right now we have an official lending rate going to large SOEs and the private yeah. sector, smaller businesses, they're still paying quite a bit for getting a loan. Exactly. I think uh, finance is definitely considered as the bloodline for economy, especially the Chinese economy. Yep. I mean, after years of financial repression, there are so many young I mean, college graduates who are very interested in doing entrepreneurial activities, but they find it very hard to set up their business, partly because of the financial constraints. Right. And the large banks, which are very used to uh, giving capital to large SOEs, they're not very familiar with and they're sometimes forbidden to uh, lend to those small and medium, medium enterprises. So I think this is where the finance innovation or the financial reform comes in, mm. where you have uh, different types of financial institutions, the banks, the uh, uh, small loan companies, the peer-to-peer -peer financing companies, or some of the peer private equity investments. They would be able to provide some flexible financing alternatives for people who have the spirit of um, entrepreneurs, but at the moment have difficulty in 
convincing or securing some financing for them to start their business or start their innovation. Because if you look at what is going on in the developed economies, it is the small and medium enterprises that's creating the most patents and the most uh, new job creations. So I think that is where the mass innovation is going to come from with the support from the financial sector. And we have now privately owned banks in China, and I'm assuming there's going to be more of that. Let's definitely hope well. for that, yes. Yeah, right. yeah. Now let's talk about the uh, continual discussion, David, about foreign investment opportunities in China's current economic roadmap here. Now, for instance, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, in which areas do you see uh, foreign investment might have a bigger chance going forward? Well, I, I think combining what we know from the past about the Belt and Road Initiative and what we heard today, uh, mm -hmm. details are new uh, yeah. in, in, the, in the work report, uh, we see a lot of potential opportunity for foreign investors there. There's clearly a demand and a desire uh, and a clear commitment by the Chinese government to integrate into Central Europe. Uh, build infrastructure and align to the government objectives to create new economic opportunity as the country moves west. Mm -hmm. uh, they've established in the past the opportunity for private capital participation in an infra infrastructure areas, which was new yeah. shortly after the, the third plenum. Today's report reinforces those commitments, provides more opportunity for private investors and probably, maybe, provides opportunities for foreign capital participation as well. Mm. Um, personally, I believe that this will happen. Personally, uh, the work reports and prior policies are a little bit mum on that topic of what does private capital participation mean. Does that mean domestic private capital participation or foreign capital participation? I think in an era of true um, efficient resource allocation, which really the government is driving for, that ultimately that will mean uh, foreign capital participation opportunities as well. Okay, some great insights. Uh, David, Professor Zhu, we're going to come back to you in just a second in which we're going to talk more about economic reform specifically. But before we come back to you guys, first, we're going to look ahead to China's economic performance this year. Our Guan Xin wraps up the country's economic milestones in 2014. Hi, my name is Guan Xing. I'm here to walk you through Chinese economy in 2014. Losing steam and perhaps better for it, China says bye-bye to break networks but welcomes a new normal of slower but better quality economic growth. Incomes are outpacing GDP, increasing 8% year-on-year. In eight regions, per capita GDP break above the 10,000 US dollar threshold. Equally cashed up and willing to spend, Chinese companies. The great overseas assets shopping spree continues. Alban capital flows surged 14% to nearly $103 billion. Even as manufacturing works out its kinks and advances in technology, these days the bright spots are in China's service economy. The added value from the service industry accounted for 48.2% of GDP in 2014. That means more jobs, more innovation, and less overcapacity. Market reforms are being rolled out nationwide based on the test bed, that is, the Shanghai Free Trade Zone. China will set up three new free trade zones in Guangdong, Fujian, and Tianjin. And there are even more potential FTZs in the pipeline. On the world stage, China is playing a key role in regional economic cooperation. In 2014, the country sealed free trade agreements with Australia, Switzerland, and South Korea and launched a Beijing roadmap of FTAAP, the free trade area of the Asia-Pacific, as a landmark initiative when hosting the APEC summit. China played a leading role in setting up the BRICS Bank to support infrastructure building in the bloc. Another grand vision is the Belt and Road Initiative a blueprint of China's ambition to create the new Silk Road economy belt and a 21st century maritime Silk Road that may cover 60% of the world's population. A new Silk Road will encompass Central Asia and South Asia and ending Australia, while the sea route will link Chinese ports to the Belgian port of Antwerp. As a sign of China's growing muscle in the world economy, China's yuan broke into the top five as the world's payment currency in November. 
the rise of various offshore clearing centers around the world, including eight new agreements signed with the People's Bank of China last year, was an important driver fueling this growth. Well, China's economic trend for this year faces considerable downward pressure, mixed with positive opportunities and gradually stabilizing market confidence. That is the response by the National Development and Reform Commission, that's China's top economic planner, concerns over China's slowing economy. The commission's chairman, Mr. Xi Shaoshi, says the pressure stems mainly from a complex international situation that includes falling oil prices, a rallying greenback, and weakening emerging economies. She also mentioned risks in China's real estate industries, and let's listen in to what he had to say. We face many difficulties and challenges. International demand will not improve much this year, but domestic consumption will increase steadily. Investment will see slow changes. At the same time, there is a change of growth momentum where property markets fiscal policies and finance have obvious potential risks. Therefore, we anticipate quite a big downward pressure on the economy. But China has strong room to maneuver, especially for the recent <coughs> central bank measures to cut the triple R and interest rates. This plus stepping up investment, these measures stabilized market expectations and confidence. Now she says China's ongoing reforms will release more energy in the markets, a better legal environment, and innovation will also drive up growth. She also said that the 2015 GDP target of around 7 percent is within a reasonable range and reflects a balance between steady economic growth and economic restructuring. It has taken in consideration for job creation and income rises as well. All right, now let's continue our discussion of this year's MPC government work report and bring back Professor Zhu and David Fry as well. So, Professor Zhu, the work report right here in the deepening reform and opening up part, the first two reforms that were listed on this list involved delegating central power to more local governments as well as streamlining government administrative procedures. And we heard about these two issues constantly back in 2014. Why are these two issues so important? Do all reforms stem from these two issues? Well, I think it is certainly uh, lying at the root of many of the problems or the reforms. Let's not forget about, well, I think Chinese government has been very, very powerful or instrumental in helping Chinese economy grow at such a phenomenal speed in the past three decades. Mm. Just because of its success or because of its power, it has come to an end where I think the government can do any further to push the economy to go even further or even more sus uh, sustainably. So I think this is where I think the critical moment comes in where I think the state would have to give more power or give more freedom to the market. So uh, uh, as uh, uh, President Xi put it, we have to have the market to, 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 to maximize its power in allocating resources. I think this is where you would have to scale back some of the resources or the power of the government so that the, the, the market will have the chance of uh, freeing its own spirit and allocating uh, the, the, the resources and also motivating people and enterprises to set up things that we have not even been able to imagine until this moment. Markets playing a decisive role yeah. exactly. in allocating resources. Mainly allowing more competition, allowing even private investment, even maybe foreign investment. So David, what role do you see uh, foreign companies would play in China's SOU forms? Oh, I, I think number one, foreign companies provide examples um, in terms of governance for how um, organizations can be structured for more efficient and optimized decision making. Less uh, bureaucracy maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That'd certainly be an achievement. And n number two, I think they provide examples uh, in terms of operating models that can be integrated into China's economy to, again, increase efficiency. I think that the opportunity for private capital participation, private investment into mm -hmm. SOEs within the SOE reform initiatives give great opportunity for integrating the best of, of uh, both worlds, if you will. Um, I, I think some, those are some of the principal examples. We're also going to see, we talk about innovation within the economy, we're going to see innovation within operating models and business partnerships as we move forward and, and, and learn step by step with progressive um, 
re relaxation of the ability for foreign companies to uh, take, take stakes and opportunities with uh, state-owned enterprises. So it's sharing experiences and also growing together. That, that's very well said, yeah. yeah. Well, Professor Zhu, what do you think are sort of the most pressing issues for state-owned enterprise reform, right? Because we have a large amount of state capital and capital overall in China concentrated in a few very, very large firms, right? So this capital needs to trickle down more yeah. to the economy. Yeah. In terms of priorities for SOE reforms, what are well, they? Well, I think there are probably two areas where it needs the most uh, attention. One is to break down the uh, monopoly in certain areas. I think, as you said, there are a lot of resources that is being taken up by those few companies which have very ex exclusive rights in operating in certain fields. I think that has to, to break down before any small, medium enterprises or private capital will have a chance of having a level ground to uh, thrive or thrive. Mm. I think this is the, the first area. The second is, I think, the corporate governance. I mean, if you look at the SOE, many of them have this two-layered uh, structure. One is the group, which is sort of opaque or not very transparent. The second is the listed company, which is sort of up to the market to judge. But there's some uh, I mean, related party transactions and lots of ways where the group and the listed company part I mean, they have a lot of dealings which the market cannot really see through. Yeah. So how can we have the business just operate as a private capital company would otherwise do? I think this is very important because that will, for one, pro pro uh, provide the, the check and balance. Mm -hmm. uh, for two, that will give the capital markets a clear information and incentive so that they know which companies are better, which they are willing to put their money with. Okay. All right. You know what? We could talk about economic reforms forever for a long time because I'd really love to dig deep into this uh, government work report because this really is a roadmap for China yeah. this year and the future as well, especially as we have the 13th five-year plan coming up as well. But we are out of time. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for coming on the show. Professor Zhu Ning from the Shanghai Jiao Tong University as well as David Fry from KPMG. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Both for joining us.